Hello everyone, this is River and I'm a PhD student of University of Maryland and Dr. Torrance is my advisor. And today I'm going to talk about some basic data analysis tools in environmental engineering. And so here shows the corresponding content in the textbook. So I hope you guys have read this part. If you, if you and if not, please read this after this lecture. And here are some of the important points adopted from the textbook. And so the first one is all environmental data should be should be scientifically reliable and legally defensible. And so that is why we need not only learn the science, but we need also be familiar with the regulatory documents. And the second one, sampling is important. If a sample is not collected properly, if it does not represent the system we are trying to analyze, then all our careful lab work is useless. And we will discuss the details of sampling in the future lectures. And the third one, sample analysis is important. If the analyst is unable to define an inherent level of analytical error, and such data are also useless. And today we are going to talk about on this topic. Um, but before we go ahead, I have two comments of the textbook of the reading part. And so the first one is the section 2.1.3. And in this uh, section, they also mentioned that uh, the first term is standard deviation, which is defined as this equation. And this is not wrong. But I would say this is a little bit confusing because we have two kinds of standard deviation, like the sample standard deviation and the population standard deviation. And based on the equation that the author give, and this should be the sample standard deviation. We know that the difference between sample standard deviation and the population standard deviation is this n. So for the population standard deviation, we divided by n, but for the sample standard deviation, we divided by uh, n minus one. But we also have a special case. Um, when the population mean is known, then sample standard deviation can be calculated by this equation with n. Um, but this situation is very rare. So in practice, we really do not meet with this situation. And the next point is, um, section 2.21 and uh, they also mentioned that uh, the central tendency is measured by three general methods the mean the median and the mode. Um, I would say that the mode will not be able to measure the central tendency for some of the situations for example we have the probability distribution shown here we can see that the mode is here here and here or something like here and so we can see that if the distribution is very skewed, then the mode cannot represent a central tendency. And it just show where the probability density is the largest. On the other hand, we may also have some situation like uh, we have the multiple modes, like something like this. And it has two modes, like here. And we can see that Clearly, uh, this mode cannot represent central tendency. And so when we are using the mode to represent central tendency, please pay attention. And OK, let's go back to the lecture. Here is the table of contents. We are going through the significant figures, errors, and uncertainty, and comparison of two means, and identification of the outliers. And so first, let's look at the rules of significant figure. Um, so basically, for the non-zero digits, they are always significant. So for this one, it has four significant figures. And any zeros that between two significant digits, they are significant. And so for this one, it has six significant figures. But uh, for the zeros that is before the non-zero digit, like for this one and this one, and they all have they only have three significant um, figures. On the other hand, for the zeros that is after the non-zero digits, like this one, and so for this one it has four significant figures. 
And finally, if we express the number in the scientific notation, so we only care about this part. And for this one, we have three significant figures. And significant figures is important when we are reporting the data. And here shows an example of the previous lab report. We can see that this table is very clean and neat. Um, and we can also see that the significant figures is very consistent uh, in this table. On the other hand, um, for the table on the right, we can see that the significant figure is very inconsistent, so it looks not that good. And so in the homework or in the lab reports, when you guys are reporting the data, um, please pay attention to the significant figures and try to make them consistent. <clears throat> and then let's look at the errors and uncertainty. And the error or the measurement error is defined as the measured quantity value minus a reference um, quantity value. And the reference quantity value is usually refers to the best estimation or the true value. But on the other hand, the uncertainty or the uncertainty of measurement is defined as a non-negative parameter characterizing the dispersion of the quantity value being attributed to a measurement based on the information used. And so basically, we can understand it like, and so basically, the measurement error is kind of like a piece of information. And an uncertainty is a summary of all these pieces of information. And now let's look at the source of error. And the first one is observer. And because different people have different sensitivity to the color change or tendency to estimate the scale rating. Um, for example, um, for this one, different people may have different uh, readings about the volume of here. Error may also come from the method of measurement, and this is due to the inadequacies in physical and chemical reactions. Um, for example, if we are measuring the concentration of a chemical in a solution based on the color change, like based on this color, but if this reaction is not complete, and then our measurement will be uh, lower than the true value. Uh, in addition, the errors can also come from instruments, and this is due to the difference between the actual value and the value indicated by the instrument. Um, for example, when we are using the balance, we need to make sure that uh, it is zeroed. On the other hand, when we are weighting the mass of an uh, object, it, it should not be out of the range of this uh, balance. And we also have a false source of error. Can you guys guess what is that? And uh, yes, the first one is the object to be measured. And this is due to heterogeneity. All the edges are not well defined. Um, for example, we are interested in the average concentration of uh, pollutants in our field. And we can see that this field has a very large spatial variability. So by taking a limited number of samples, it will be hard to estimate the average concentration in this field. And this will introduce some of the errors. And then let's look at the types of errors. Basically, we have three types of error. And the first one is random error, systematic error, and gross error. For random error, the data scattered approximately symmetrically about the mean value, and it will affect precision, and we can deal with it statistically. And so basically, the random error is usually assumed to be follow a normal distribution with mean equals to zero. Um, and because of this, we can take multiple samples and do multiple measurements, and then take the average. By doing this, we can mitigate and the influence of random error. And for the systematic error, it refers to the consistent repeatable error associated with faulty equipment or flow experimental design. It can also refer to the readings that is too high or too low. It will affect accuracy. And so for example, suppose the x refers to the actual value and y refers to the measured value. If the measurement is perfect, then x should equal to y, and then we will have this red dashed line here. 
Um, but for the systematic error, it may refer to this green line. Um, we can see that the we can see that the measured value is consistently greater than the actual value, or it may be refers to this um, blue line, uh, which means that when the true value is small, then the true value is consistently greater than the measured value, but when the true value is large, and then the measured value is consistently greater than the true value. Also, we have the gross error. It's usually obvious, and it can be given as the outlier. And suppose we have the data like shown here, and clearly we can see that the point A is very far away from the other data points. So for point B, and it is an outlier. On the other hand, for the point B, it gets closer to the data points. So it is very likely to be the outlier. But for the point C, we can see that it is very hard to say if it is an outlier or not. And so basically, the outlier should be detected um, by carrying out sufficient replicate measurements. And we have some statistical methods um, to determine if they are an outlier or not. And here's the summary from US EPA and in the textbook. And the textbook also discussed um, the test for the outliers. And then let's look at the measurements of error. And the first one is accuracy, which refers to the measurements of agreement between measured value and the true value. And of, and of course, the true value is usually unknown. And geometrically, accuracy is described by the distance shown here. And accuracy can be measured by an absolute error, which is defined as this one. And it can also be measured by the relative error, like defined as this. Uh, on the other hand, we also have precision, which is uh, relates to the reproducibility of the results. And that is to say, how similar the values obtained in exactly the same way. And geometrically, precision refers to the dispersion of the data. And it can be measured by absolute difference, which is defined here. And it can also be measured by standard deviation of the sample, which is defined as this one. Um, in practice, we will have high or low accuracy or high or low precision. So we will have four combinations. And um, this is for low accuracy and low precision. This is bad. We don't want this. And for the high accuracy and high precision, this is good and perfect. We are trying to um, get it, but the perfect cannot be reached. And so in practice, we usually have these two situations a low accuracy and high precision or high accuracy but low precision. Do you guys think which one is more preferred among these two? Um, now let's look at the practice. Um, so for the first one, it is precise and accurate. And for the second one, it is imprecise but accurate. Um, for the third one, it is precise but inaccurate. For the fourth one, we can say that it is imprecise and inaccurate, which is bad. Uh, in practice, we are using the lab equipment, and this lab equipment has their own accuracy and precision. Like shown here, this is the pipette, and we have the accuracy and we have the precision summarized here. And we also have the volumetric flux, and here is the error. And we also have the analytical balance and here shows the measurement error. And then let's talk about uh, error propagation because error will propagate through the functional relations. First, let's look at the theories, uh, which can help us understand and remember the error propagation equations. And suppose we have the function like y equals to uh, fx here, and this is a function curve. And suppose we have this x0, and delta x refers to the distance uh, shown here. And so this x0 will be projected into y, and for the delta x, it will be projected as the delta y2, and this one will, will have delta y1. And based on this graph, clearly we can see that delta y1 does not equal to delta y2 because 
and this function is not is not linear. Although y1 and y2 can be calculated, but this is a little bit difficult to do the calculation. And so we can do we can make some assumptions to make the calculation easier. So let's assume um, delta x is very small. If we have this assumption, and then we can do a tangent line like the L shown here, and then um, delta x can be projected as delta y1 and delta y2. And because this is a line, so delta y1 equals to delta y2, and we can just let them equals to delta y. Um, based on this relation, we have delta y equals to the um, dy over dx times dx. So this is uh, easier for the calculation. And similarly, if we have a function with multiple variables, uh, like shown here, and so this is very practical because, for example, we have the concentration equals to uh, the mass over the volume, which can be expressed as the concentration is a function of mass and uh, volume. And so basically, this is a general form. And for this function with multiple variable, it has a hidden assumption that uh, all the xi's are orthogonal, which means all the x-axis are perpendicular to each other. So we can also have this equation, so delta y can be calculated um, by this equation. And in the context of statistics, we can have x1, x2, all the way to x, y, and we assume they are uncorrelated normal variables. Uncorrelated normal variables um, means that they are independent. And independence in statistic which is equivalent to orthogonal. So they are equivalent. Also, we can assume delta x1, delta x2, all the way to delta xi. They are standard uncertainty or random error. And we can assume they are small. And because they are random error, so the expectation of delta xi equals to zero. And based on this, uh, we can see that we can take the expectation on both sides of this equation. So the expectation of delta y equals to this part is zero, this part is zero and zero. So basically, the expectation of delta y equals to zero. And so this is our conclusion. This is useful, but because we are looking at the propagation of error, it does not tell us about that. So even though this is useful, but we don't like it. And so then let's take the square on both sides. And so we can have this equation on the right side. We can open the brackets. So we have two parts, like here. And for the cross product parts, and they equals to zero. So this one can be eliminated. So basically, we will have this equation. And we can simplify to uh, this equation. And from this equation, we can see that uh, the square of error of y equals to the sum of square of partial y over partial xi times the error of xi. Um, and then we can keep this uh, equation on the right side. And let's uh, look at some examples. And the first example is summation and subtraction, and the general form is this. And in practice, we may have some uh, situations like the sigma v equals to the volume of sample plus the volume of water. So basically, this process is called dilution. Uh, and uh, uh, in this equation, the ais are uh, constant. So Basically, we calculate the partial y over partial xi, and uh, it equals to an uh, ai. And then we can um, plug this uh, into this equation, so we will have this one. And basically, we can just open this uh, equation, so we can have this one. It tells us that the square of arrow of y equals to the sum of square of the factor of xi times the error of x, and this corresponds to the row number three and in the table. 
And then let's look at the second one, which is division. For division, this is also very useful because, for example, like the concentration equals to the mass over the volume. Uh, so here, uh, in this equation, A and B are constant. And so still, we can calculate partial Y over partial X1 equals to this one, and partial Y over partial X2, which equals to this one. And then we can plug this equation into this one. So we can get this uh, equation. This equation looks a little bit creepy, um, but we can simplify this. So basically, we can take the square of the original equation. So we can have this one. And in this equation, we can see that it has a similar part, like shown here. So we can plug this equation into uh, this equation. So we can have this one, and we can undo some of the, and then we can do some organizations to this equation, and finally we can have this one. Um, from this equation, we can, and we can see that delta y over y, which is equals to, which refers to the relative error of y, and this is a relative error of x one, and this is a relative error of x two. So basically, this equation tells us that. And the square of relative error of y equals to the sum of square of relative of x1 and x2. And this corresponds to the row number 5 in the table. And then let's look at this example number 3, which is multiplication. And this is also useful because if we want to calculate the volume, the volume equals to the flux times the time and times the area. And it can have this form um, where, a1, where a and b are constant. And still we can calculate the partial y over partial x1, partial y over partial x2. And then we can plug in to this equation. So we will have this equation. Still we can take the square of this equation on both sides and plug into this one. And do the and after organization we have this equation. And surprisingly, we can see that uh, these two equations are the same. And it also tells us that uh, the real the square of relative error of y equals to the sum of square of relative error of x one and x two, and it corresponds to the row number seven in the table. And then let's look at an example. And so based on this equation, actually, we can derive any functional relations. And here is a summary of error propagation equations. And uh, for the number one all the way to number six or number seven, um, this we have already derived. And if you are interested in the details, you can read this tape, you can read this paper. And then let's look at an um, practice problem. Uh, you can press stop to try this problem. Um, and here is the answer. Please let me know if you have any questions. And then let's look at the comparison of two means. Um, so basically, suppose we have two samples um, that are analyzed under the identical condition. And we have the question, are they significantly different? Um, before I give the t-test equation, I would like to talk about the ideas of the t-test. Um, so basically, the question is if mu1 equals to mu2, or mu1 does not equal to mu2. And this question is equivalent to the question that um, if mu1 minus mu2 equals to 0, and mu1 minus mu2 does not equal to 0, and, and we can define this variable d. And so basically, we know that for the sample, it follows a normal distribution. And for the sample mean, it follows a t distribution. And the, the same for the second set of sample. And then the linear combination of two t distribution also follows a t distribution. So the difference d also follows a t distribution with sum of degrees of freedom and the sum mean and some standard deviation. And this can be calculated based on, on the samples. 
and based on this t distribution, we can con construct a 95% uh, confident interval for d. And if zero is inside this confidence interval, then there is no significant difference. But if zero is outside 95% confidence interval, then there is significant difference. And so basically the t-test is based on this idea. And here is the uh, equation of t-tests. We can see that uh, this is a confidence interval. And so the full name of this t-test is called two-tailed t-test for independent means with equal variance. Um, but in this lecture, but in this course, uh, we can just call it a t-test. And so in this equation, S can be calculated by, by the sample, and N refers to the total degrees of freedom, and alpha refers to the significant level, and usually alpha equals to and 0 0.05. And based on this uh, confidence interval, we can see that if 0 is inside it, then there is no significant difference. And if 0 is outside it, then there is significant difference. And then let's look at an example. And so here we have two sets of the data, and we have the mean and the standard deviation of each one. So basically, we just plug in all the numbers into this uh, equation. We can calculate a uh, degree of freedom. We can calculate the uh, standard deviation, and we can uh, calculate the t-value. The t-value is based on the table, uh, like shown here. And then we plug in all the numbers into this confidence interval. We will have this value. And clearly, we can see that zero does not belong to this interval. So they are significantly different. Um, finally, let's look at the outlier identification. So as mentioned before, outliers are measurements that are extremely large or small relative to the rest of the data, and they are suspected or misinterpreting the population from which they were collected. So the basic question is, are there outliers in the data set? Suppose we have the sample like here. And uh, one of the methods to identify the potential outlier is box plot. And so here shows a structure of a box plot. So basically, we have the maximum value of the data set, and we have the minimum value of the data set. We also have this like Q2, which refers to the median of the whole data set. And we also have this Q3, which is defined as the median of the upper half. And uh, we also have Q1, which is defined as a median of the lower half. And based on these box plots, we can also define this interquantile range, which is defined as IQR, and it can be calculated by Q3 minus Q1. And so based on these box plots, we can also define a upper fence and a lower fence. Upper fence is defined as Q3 plus 1.5 times IQR. And the lower fence is defined as Q1 uh, minus 1.5 times IQR. And based on the upper fence and lower fence, we can have this range, like shown here. And then if, if a data does not belong to this range, then this data is considered as a potential outlier. And let's see an example. Um, so here shows the data. I have already ordered them from small to large. And based on this, we can see that the median um, should be like this. So it is the average of this two value. So the median is uh, 29. And then for Q3, it is a median of the upper half, so it is 33. And for the Q1, it is a median of the lower half, and so it is 25. And then we can calculate the IQR, which equals to um, this one. And based on the IQR and Q1 and Q3, we can calculate the upper fence and the lower fence, um, like shown here. So based on these two values, we can construct our range.
and uh, based on the data we can see that um, 56 does not belong to this range and so 56 is a potential outlier and uh, we need to note that this is a potential outlier this is not a statistical outlier and when we have identified this as a potential outlier then further statistical test is needed and the statistical tests are summarized before and so that's it for today please let me know if you have any questions thank you very much